So let's start with uh, what the heck food sanity is anyways. <laughs> I am sure that you can relate to food crazy. Uh, that's that voice, you know, that voice in your head that scrutinizes and judges every food thought that you have. Uh, <laughs> is this good? Is it bad? Is it healthy? Is it not? Is it on plan? Is it off the wagon? Um, I find this time of year, it's so loud. Uh, we Canadians just finished having Thanksgiving. Halloween is next week. Um, U.S. Thanksgiving is coming very soon. And hot on its heels is Christmas. So this is the time of year where food is everywhere. Um, and the mixed messages, right? Because we're thinking about all that food and wanting to enjoy. But, um, you know, the dieting world has already started to put out the New Year's resolution stuff. So we know what food crazy is. So food sanity is learning how to shut that down and to get off the dieting treadmill once and for all. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, food is always going to be around. It's been used throughout human history, rites of passage, celebrations, uh, everything you can think of, food is involved. And it always has been and it will continue to be. So the trick for us is to learn how to be with food and not be crazy. Now I'm going to be cruising along fairly quickly. I have so much I'd like to share with you and uh, I can't keep you here all night. So <laughs> what I will do though is send you a recording. And uh, that way, uh, the exercises that we do tonight, you can go back and listen to them again, especially if you're driving or uh, if you've got little ones distracting you or anything else, you can get back to it. I'd also like to take this moment to just say thank you. You know, lots of people sign up for webinars, lots of people sign up for lots of things, and not very many actually follow through. And you did. So thank you for spending the evening with me. And um, I will, at the end of the webinar, give you an opportunity to know how to work with me. If that's something that interests you, please know that it's perfectly okay if it's not, and you are going to get a ton of value tonight, and, uh, and you're going to be able to implement some things starting today. Okay, so let's start out with, can you relate to this poor woman? What kind of relationship do you have with food and body? Um, these webinars are so much more fun if you can interact with me. It's great to have a conversation with you as opposed to with my screen. And uh, you can type in the comment bar and then I will be able to pull those up and, um, and actually speak with you. Uh, so if you have comments, questions, please do type them in. And I would love to know what your experience has been. What kind of relationship that you've had with food? Um, how old were you the first time you decided that you were going to lose weight? <laughs> um, and what was the reason behind it? You know, was it health? Uh, was it a boy? Was it a comment someone made? What is it that the very first time, what is it that had you going? Yeah, dance. Yeah. Yeah, not looking like the girls in the magazine. That one I relate to tremendously. You have no idea. <laughs> I'll share my story a bit later, but that was a big one for me. Mom said you were too heavy. Yeah, that um, unfortunately is not uncommon. Uncle, yeah, family members, right? And it, it may have come from, I mean, we hope, and it probably did come from a place of good intention. Just probably didn't pan out that way. Okay, so the question, of course, though, is what would you like it to be like? Because I'm here to tell you that you can actually feel calm and sane around food all the time, even during this crazy few months. And what would that be like for you? Family dinners, if you were calm and confident. Yeah. All right. Just ponder that for a moment. So before we go into everything, I'd like to introduce myself. So that's me. Um, my name is Dr. Carrie Fullerton. I am a naturopathic doctor up here in Ontario, Canada. And um, 
geez, where does it even begin? My beginning is right at the beginning. As long as I can remember, I have always had this affinity for food, especially sweet food. Um, always felt like I wanted a little bit more than everyone else around me. Always had this sense of shame, sense of guilt, sense of, um, I don't know, like I had to hide it. I was being bad. I was uh, forever trying to sneak things. And um, I guess by the time I went on my first diet, I was in grade eight. Yeah. And um, I think the saddest part of my story is that I didn't actually have any weight to lose in grade eight. I just didn't look like the girls in the magazine. Didn't have a lot of confidence. I was shy and, uh, you know, in hindsight, now, now it was social anxiety. But at the time, I just felt like I didn't quite fit. And, um, you know, all the cool girls on the magazines and on the TV shows and on the movies, they didn't look like me. They were much smaller, uh, especially in the legs. So I decided that I needed to lose some weight. Uh, my mom took me to Weight Watchers because that was the healthy thing, which uh, is still considered the healthy thing. It's a diet, no matter which way you look at it and spin it upside down and all around, it's a diet. But I'll save that rant for another time. <laughs> but off I went. Anyways, um, you know, that was the beginning of my cycle. It carried on through high school, all the way through university. When I got to naturopathic colleges, when it peaked to an incredible level, I, um, I felt an even greater sense that everyone was watching and that I really had to look the part. I felt like everyone looked at every bite that I ate, my body, and that I, I really needed to step it up. So my obsession with food and body just got worse while I was there. And then uh, one day I wandered into the bookstore and I found a book called It's Not About Food. And it absolutely changed the direction of my dieting history forever. Uh, it took a long time because I didn't have any support. I didn't know anybody who was doing the work. I only knew of this book. So I started to do the work. And, um, you know, I found the food freedom. I found peace with my body. And it made such a difference in my world. And people started to notice and ask. I started to share it with my patients. And they got there a whole lot faster than I did didn't take them a decade. <laughs> it was, uh, it was happening over months. So it was pretty incredible. And, um, it really became my life's work. And, um, so now I'm trying to share it with the world. So again, I thank you for being here tonight and, uh, and helping me spread this, this message. All right, enough about me, but I am an open book. So if you have questions, please ask. So, this is the dieting yo-yo, right? This is the cycle that I got on and this is the biggest challenge with uh, the food and the crazy is this desire to lose weight. And um, the moment that's decided, you know, there's hope, there's excitement and, um, you know, you get to be good and be on track and you can stop thinking about it, which is interesting because then it's all you think about, but you think, you know, there's a plan, and someone else is going to tell me what I need to do. But it's virtually guaranteed that it comes back. In fact, one of the best predictors for future weight gain is whether or not someone is currently trying to lose weight. Whether you call it a diet or not, if someone's intentionally trying to lose weight right now, I can almost guarantee that within five years, they're going to have that weight back and probably a little bit more. And so it goes from that first intentional weight loss, the cycling up and down and down. Food becomes the enemy. Your body feels like it's betrayed you. And the cycle carries on. Now what's worse is that it's not just the weight cycling and the health risks that go with weight cycling. Again, that's a rant for another day. But it is the shame of not being able to stick to the plan, right? It's the criticism from the doctor's I can't tell you how many of my clients have come back from a doctor's appointment and basically been told that they're liars. Because if they were doing what they said, they would have lost weight, right? That sense of failure. I mean, that's where the real damage happens. It's, it's heartbreaking. It wears you down. And each time it gets harder and harder to follow the plan. It gets harder and harder to lose weight. Our bodies are smart. They fight it yeah 
here's what I really need you to know. And I hope that you're listening closely right now. This system is rigged to fail. It is not your fault. Everything about it is rigged. There's only only one way that's presented. It's their way and there's just no room and it's in their best interest for you to keep coming back, to keep needing them. This is just unfortunately the way it goes. So the only way that you can stop the cycle is to stop the dieting. Now, here's the cool part before you freak out. <laughs> you don't actually have to give up on yourself or your health in order to do this. What I learned through that decade after I picked up that book, and it was a lot of trial and error, but what I learned was that all the solutions out there, they keep focusing on food, right? They focus on the food. Even some of the body positive programs that are available out there, they still restrict food or they weigh and measure your body, or they have this program that's, you know, to follow. It's all external. It's all out there. Now, the challenge with that is that these programs are still feeding the underlying issue, which is that you are the captain of your own ship. You and your body know what's best for you, but no one is teaching you how to do that. So it's no wonder that they never, ever worked. And what I'd like to do tonight is share with you the path. And the path, uh, the steps really required to overcome this. And um, it's pretty cool to come at the other side of it, be standing down at the other end of that path and, and asking people to trust me to, to take those steps. So thank you for trusting me and for being here tonight and to hear what this is all about. So... One of the big ahas for me through this whole process was that it is a body, mind, and spirit thing. And I know that's overused, the body, mind, spirit thing, and I wish I had a better way of saying it, but I don't know how. We are a complex being. We have a mind, we have a body, we have a heart and a soul, we have a spirit. And our challenges with food, every single layer of that is, has been affected. And so the solution needs to address all of those things. So while I was going through finding my way, I discovered most programs did not address all of it. Just recently, I have a, a couple that I work with, which is such a treat because normally I only see the women, but um, this gentleman is very invested and, and it's super exciting. But anyways, so they were sitting there and talking and, and she had ended up going to McDonald's again. I guess maybe it was, doesn't matter. The frequency is sort of the point. It doesn't matter how often she went. Her husband was feeling very frustrated because they'd made this commitment um, that they were really going to be more mindful of their food. Um, there are some health challenges, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, <laughs> what I was explaining to them was that we, if we keep working on why she landed in that drive through we're never getting the bigger picture. Let's look back. Why did she go? What was the motivation? It's not just about that she was at the drive through and ate the food. What drove her there in the first place? If we can step back, take the judgment off, get super curious, we can see all the different factors that led to that one moment where that's what she chose. And that's what most programs don't do, right? They just tell you not to eat the food. But that doesn't help you when you're standing in front of the food. My big, big motivation for this. Oh, I was skipping a slide there. I was forgetting to tell you the peace side of it, which is why you're here, right? Doesn't that look beautiful? So the food sanity side of it is understanding what lands you to where you land to and then to have the choice. Because you can, every healthy diet involves any food that you could ever imagine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with eating McDonald's here and there. Ha! Gasp! The naturopath said that, but it's true. Our bodies are remarkable things that can handle a lot of different things. So let's take a step back, let's be calm, and let's work on the root issues. Because then, food sanity is about caring for yourself, caring enough about yourself to make different choices 
And that's what's very cool. So we're going to get into the how. These little girls are what motivate me. They're not my girls. They are the girls out there in this world that I haven't met yet. They are who I hope to influence so that they don't go through what you and I went through. I don't want them in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s finding someone like me to help them through this. I would like us to teach them now how to have this peaceful relationship with their body and their and their food. I would like them to use those beautiful minds to change the world, to pool their resources, their money and their time and their energy and, and make a difference and not spend it looking to their body to find their happiness or their confidence or their sense of self-worth. That's what lights me up. That's why I do this work. So what I find is that most women are at war with their body. Can you relate to that? They feel like their body is the enemy, the food is the enemy, and they're forever at war. So I wanted to show you what I'm trying to save these little girls from, and you may see yourself on this. And I would love for you to be on the peace side of this. Sometimes I get the opportunity of working with women when they're right at the bottom. So the, the scale on the right there, that's your, the, the confidence scale. Typically, these women are hiding, though, because they're terrified. They're not just hiding a little bit. They're absolutely like under the covers, under the bed, terrified. They feel like they're never going to stop eating. They feel like it's always going to be this way. They dread every holiday because they know what's coming and it's it's awful for them. The next stage, which is typically where I, I see people, is in, they're in the shame cycle. They feel quite ashamed that they haven't been able to follow a plan, that they haven't been able to just, you know, get to it, because that's the way it's all been designed. That, you know, you're to blame, not the program, but I've already told you it's rigged that way. So they're hiding out, their confidence is pretty low. The next stage up from that is an angry stage and, and it's a blame stage. Now the very cool part about meeting people in the angry stage is that there's two ways it can go. If they turn the anger inward, get mad at themselves for not being able to do it, well then they cycle back down into this bottom part. They stay in war. They drop back down into shame and fear. They keep eating. They keep cycling. But if they can take that anger and they can shift it outward where it belongs, they can jump the line. They can start to connect with other women, with other people who are going through the same thing. And they can immediately find a sense of calm because they know they're not the only one and they can start to see that they are not to blame and their confidence really does start to rise. And then we build on that and they get to step into a strength that they didn't even know they had. They find this courage and it's just beautiful to watch and their confidence continues to rise. And then finally they get all the way up to true confidence and that's where the freedom is. That's where they are truly at peace and they are able to navigate. They can eat any way they need to for their health. They can absolutely enjoy their food and not feel anxious about family dinners and all of that stuff. They're living their lives. And it is such an honor to walk women through this process. And tonight I'm going to show you how you can do that and get there. I'd love to know what your experience has been, though. You know, how has it been? This whole food thing, the diet thing, the weight loss industry. I mean, you're here for a reason. What is that? It's exhausting. Yes, <laughs> very true. It is exhausting. Yeah. Stressful, confusing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep moving. Um, let me walk you through the steps. It starts with consciously calm or just calm. Calm is the beginning place because it has to be. Chaos is a place that 
there's no there's no long term solution there, and that's the world that the dieting space wants us to stay in. Because as long as we're in chaos, as long as we're confused, we need them. When you're calm, you get the opportunity to hear your own voice. You get to step out of the turmoil and all that crazy and step into your own tranquil space and hear your own voice. Once that's firmly established, again, body, mind, and spirit, then we can work on control, taking back what's yours. And instead of it being this effort and this white knuckling stressful experience, it can be with ease. And then you move into your authentic confidence. Instead of being beat up, you get to be brave. And what's very cool is that you get to find this peaceful place that is playful and fun. And you get your power back. And that is my definition of freedom. Now, obviously nothing happens overnight. <laughs> it all takes some time. This is the program that I walk women through. We start down here and up we go. So we spend time in calm. We spend time in confidence and control. And this is how women go from that sense of failure and get to that sense of freedom. Now, obviously tonight, I cannot walk you through every single one of these because, well, it's a 12 week program. But what I can do is teach you a couple of key tools from each of the calm control and confidence so that you can start right now taking yourself into that better place. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, so control. Clearly I used the wrong photo there. <laughs> I did pay for it, I promise. Okay, so calm is, calm is finding that place within you where your voice can finally be heard, right? I mean, the dieting world is made and lives off confusion. So many voices. Every single time that you've tried to lose weight or someone's made a comment, guess what's happened? Well, you've added another voice in there to just, screw things up, make it impossible to know what the next step is. So by creating a place of calm, you can actually step into your own voice and you can develop um, that first sense of or first step towards really honoring and respecting what your body needs. They are keeping you trapped. And when you see that and you can see their tricks and their tools, you can't unsee them anymore. And that's very cool because that means that you can break out, you know? They trap us with all the new stuff that just eat that, don't eat that. It's easy, right? They win. They win if you believe that it all comes down to protein or that it's the sugar, it's the fat. No, it's the meat. It's the, <laughs> it's the carbs. I think carbs are currently the devil. You're always going to need them if you stay in there. And it's downright shocking that they've been able to succeed with their high failure rate. It is absolutely shocking. Although maybe it's not because like any abusive relationship, they've convinced you that it was your fault. So stepping out of the turmoil and into the tranquility. Let's walk through how that happens. Step one is to schedule some time. Now, if you're not driving right now, let's do this together. If you are driving, come back to it. Uh, like I said, I'm going to send you a recording so you can you can do this exercise when you get home. Um, mm -hmm. But play with it a little bit and see how you do. So the first thing to do is to set some time aside. And the best way to create a new habit is to piggyback it on something you do every day. So this could be uh, while you're brushing your teeth. This could be right before bed. It could be as soon as you wake up. It could be sitting in the driveway after work. Just stick it in your schedule somewhere. Uh, it can be 30 seconds. It could be five minutes. If you're new to s being calm, <laughs> doing any of this work, honestly, a minute makes a massive difference in your day. And then the second step is to sit still. Now, this does not mean that you have to sit in the lotus position on a, on a mat or a bolus or whatever those <laughs> those things are called. You can sit in a chair. You can sit on a couch. You can sit anywhere. Just be still. That's the key here, is just stillness. And then spin your tail. And how are you going to do that? Well, normally we follow all the thoughts in our brain, but with this exercise, what you're going to do is look around your room. 
Where are you right now? What do you hear? And then talk it out. Yes, people around you might think you're a little crazy, but I promise you this works well. <laughs> you can do it in your head, but I really think the verbal side of it works. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through my room so I can feel the heat on my left leg from the heater. It's warmer than the other one. I can see the painting on my wall. It's brown. I can see my computer screen. I can hear the TV in the other room. I can feel my pants against my legs. I can feel the floor underneath my feet. I can feel my heart beating. Maybe I'm more nervous than I thought. So what I did there was I just brought myself into what's happening right now. The cool thing about our brains is that we can't actually have two thoughts simultaneously. You can have many thoughts flowing through your mind at the same time, but you can't actually pay attention to more than one at a time. So by speaking them, you are forced to bring yourself to the right here and the right now. So set a timer and do this every day. And the reason why doing this every day is because the research around mindfulness, which is what you just did, congratulations, you just meditated for the first time. Maybe your first time, but that is meditating. That is mindfulness, it's being present. And the research with it is so strong. Many, many studies um, have shown it decreases binge eating dramatically. It increases body confidence, happiness scales, life satisfaction. All around, it can create some positive change. And you can do it in 30 seconds a day. That's pretty cool, right? Here's how it can influence your relationship with food and contribute to food sanity. So Jen is a client of mine, and um, she had completed the 12-week program, and I got this text from her. She said, Carrie, thank you. Tonight was the first night in my life I said no to dessert, not because it was too fattening, not because I didn't think it looked amazing, but because I genuinely didn't want it. I was full and knew I couldn't enjoy it thoroughly right now. So I said, man, does that ever look good? Would you mind if I take some home to enjoy tomorrow with a cup of tea? It was easy. Thank you. I share that story only because how many times have you eaten because it was there and you thought maybe you'd never get it again? Dessert, sweets... Maybe it was bread, maybe, I mean, who knows what. But so many times we eat, not really because it's what we need or what we want, but because it's there and we're scared that we might never get a chance to have it again. But food sanity incorporates the idea that you can actually trust that you can always eat whatever you need. It's never going to be off the table as an option. what would your life look like if you could honor what your body wanted? And maybe it would be to have dessert, but it would be a genuine choice. How cool would that be? Now it's your call. You get to pick. Which way do you want to go? What if you didn't have to spend all that time thinking about food? Cool, right? So then the next thing to develop is control. Once the calm is in place, you get to take back your control. And one of the key things I like to use a piece of the serenity prayer is to know the wis to have the wisdom to know the difference between what you can and cannot control. And to put all of your time and energy into the things that you actually can control. And I'm sorry to break it to you, but your weight is not as much in your control as you think. And this is the biggest problem is that most of the time we're focusing on the wrong target because that's what they keep giving us, the same target. BMI, weigh this much, be this size, have this amount of body fat. These targets are outside of our control. One of the questions I ask every woman I work with, what is it that you really want? 
Is it your weight or is it your health? And they look at me puzzled. It's not the same thing. I know it feels like it because the world we live in has had, they just, they're so intertwined now. It feels like health and weight are synonymous and they're not. They don't actually mean the same thing. Now I, as a doctor, am highly motivated to help you reach your health goals. The diet and fitness industry, they're more, they're more motivated to keep your eye on the weight target because that's one that you are likely to keep failing and not see results at, which means you need to keep going back. It's just like a magician, right? The only way they can trick you is if they keep your attention somewhere else. So this is where you get to go from all of that effort, feeling like you're pushing that stone up the hill to finding a sense of ease. So grab a pen and paper. Sorry, I meant to tell you that at the beginning. If you're driving, obviously you can't do that. Maybe you have a phone nearby. This works better if you can write it down while we're thinking about it. Then you can add to it later. But just quickly grab something you can write with. Getting clear on what it is you're really after is step one here. This is where you really get to figure out some control. So yes, I know that you would like to be a smaller size. That's fine. You don't have to actually make that one go away for this to work. <laughs> what I want you to do is shift your focus away from that though and really get clear. What is it you think that you're going to get from losing weight? I mean, they know this, they being the diet and fitness industry. They don't put on their commercials the weight loss as the primary motivator. No, it's confidence, it's happiness, it's fitting in, it's getting the guy, it's... It's always something else. So for instance, if you have some, if fitness is your goal, well, what does fitness look like? You know, get super clear on that. Is it that you want to be able to go and get the mail without being winded? Is it that you'd like to go up a flight of stairs without being winded? Is it like you'd like to get up and down from the ground to play with your children or your grandchildren? What are the fitness goals you're actually after? Because losing weight doesn't guarantee that any of those things can occur. What is it that you'd really like from your fitness? Is there a trail you'd like to hike? A bike ride you'd like to be able to take? Okay, have you got those written down? What if it's health goals? So maybe it's your blood sugars are starting to go a little wonky. So maybe that's the health goal. Maybe it's um, your blood pressure. Yeah, maybe it's some cholesterol issues. What are the health things that you would like to improve on? Okay, now this next one might shock you. Please stay with me. Get rid of the scale. What? <laughs> Take a few deep breaths. Work with me here. <laughs> Knowing what you weigh has its merits. There are times when, um, when, when it's important. So let's take, for instance, uh, if you were to buy some sporting equipment, right? My, um, I'm going to learn how to snowboard this year. And I don't know if it's like skiing, but when you get your bindings done with skiing, you have to tell them how much you weigh so that the bindings release properly, right? They're not flying off all the time and they actually come off if you fall. It's a good time to know your weight. Or if you want to go zip lining and there's a maximum uh, weight, you know, it's, it's a safety thing. It's really important to know what you weigh. Another time that it would be really important to know what you weigh is if you were taking a medication that depended on your weight. But short of safety things, your weight doesn't actually give you that much of a valuable piece. Sorry, I think my mic just disappeared there in my back. Can you hear me? Just click on the hand if you can hear me. 
Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> and we have returned. Okay. So the scale. Yes. Um, so knowing what you weigh, there are some circumstances. I don't know where I dropped off. So I'm just going to go back to that. Uh, medication, um, sporting equipment. Those are really important times. But otherwise, it's not usually a useful tool. And in fact, it can actually cause more damage. And I'm starting to see those comments pop up, right? Guarantees a bad mood. <laughs> Most people, you know, they're doing some exercising, they're doing Weight Watchers, they're feeling really good about themselves, and then they weigh themselves and it says that, you know, maybe she gained or maybe she didn't lose, or this is the best, she did lose, but actually didn't lose as much as she wanted to. And then what happens? Well, she stops doing all the things that were good for her, that were healthy, that were providing her with, with longevity, with life, right? So I encourage everybody to at least over the course of the 12 weeks we're working together, but I hope it becomes a permanent thing, that they just get rid of it. Now, some are not willing to, and if if that's you, that's okay. Here's my here's my compromise or my other suggestion. Keep a journal next to the scale, and write in it before you get on it how you're feeling. Do that again when you get off the scale, and just start to pay attention to what it's providing you with. Is it actually serving you in any way? I know lots of women feel like. If they stop weighing themselves, then they're just going to let their weight get out of control. I'm going to show you that that's not true. And, um, but anyways, that's my two cents on the scale. If you're still weighing and measuring your body, well, then that's what you're telling yourself is the most important thing. And if the most important thing is your health and your fitness, like we just talked about, well, then you don't need the scale. Okay. Well, then the third step, of course, would be what are you going to measure? Because this is what people say to me. Well, Carrie, if I'm not going to weigh myself, how am I going to know how I'm doing? Well, the how you're doing is in the doing. So you can measure how many times you showed up. You know, did you exercise? Did you choose to honor your hunger and actually eat when you were hungry? Did you stop when you were full? Did you choose to go for a walk instead of sitting in front of the TV, did you, I mean, there's so many ways that you could measure that. You can also measure those other pieces, right? So if, let's say your fitness goal was that you wanted to be able to get up a flight of stairs, not winded. Or maybe your fitness goal was that you wanted a stronger core. You'll notice I said stronger core and not flatter stomach. There is a difference. So if I want to measure, if I'm getting more endurance, I, I can do stairs every day and at some point I'm going to get to the top of them and I'm not going to be winded anymore, but it might take me a couple weeks to get there, but I can measure that. If I want a stronger core, I can measure how many sit-ups I can do or how long I can hold plank for. I can track all of that and I can measure that. But I think the most important thing to measure is, did you show up? Because that's the piece, that's the longevity piece. Did you show up? Why this is so important is because here's, I'm going to geek out on you for just a quick second here with the research. The weight loss research sucks from a success standpoint. And I told you it was rigged to fail, but over and over again, so my favorite study is the diabetes prevention study, and that's because of how well it was done. Most nutrition studies are terribly, terribly put together. Um, so you always have to take those with a grain of salt. But this one was actually really well done. It was thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people. And they were all in this pre-diabetes stage, and they wanted to know how they could stop these people from developing diabetes. And there was many arms of the study, and one of them was the diet and lifestyle one, diet and fitness. So they put these people on an eating plan. They put these people on an exercise plan. And to no surprise, they all started to lose weight. And they continued to lose weight for six months. And the average weight loss was about 7 to 10% of their body mass. 
What's interesting, though, is at the six-month mark, and this is repeated in most studies, is that the weight started to come back on. Despite the fact that they were still following the plan, they were still moving their bodies, they were still eating as they were told, and these people had support. Holy, tons of support. Lots of counseling, lots of meetings, lots of support. But here's the key part, is that despite the fact that by the end of 12 months they had gained almost all the weight back, they managed to prevent 60% of them from developing diabetes. That's massive. So massive, in fact, that they shut down the other arms of the study that included medication because they felt like it was unethical to not put people into this part of it. It's a significant difference. But they were still fat. Do you see what I mean? Even Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, all of them, if you look at their successes, it's on average between 4 and 15 pounds that these people lost. Now, if you're just a little bit overweight, that might bring you into a normal BMI. But for the average North American woman, that kind of change doesn't take you from fat to not fat. But it does make a huge difference in your health and your future. But if you're focused on the scale, you're going to miss all that because you're going to get pissed off because it's not going to work the way you think it's supposed to or the way that they told you it was going to. So this is why I really encourage you to put the scale away and find a new way to measure. Work where you have some control. This hit home for one of my clients. Her name's Megan. And for her, this, this, this was the pivot point in the program for her, where she just got it. It all came together. And she went, Carrie, I get it. I have this beautiful little girl, and I don't want her to grow up thinking that women diet all the time, that women are always obsessing over their weight, that women stop enjoying she started to live her life. She started to be more active. She started to make healthier choices for herself because it became about her daughter and it became about her health. It stopped being about what she looked like and how much she weighed. And a year later, she is still making these healthy choices and her daughter is incredible. It's a beautiful relationship. So that lights me up because of course that feeds my mission more than anything. But it was such a big deal for her to finally realize, you know, she has spent 30 years battling her weight. And she finally stepped into that place of peace and is finally making amazing choices for herself. And it's beautiful. and such a role model. So if you haven't written on your piece of paper yet, what are you after? What are you really doing this for? Why do you keep trying to lose weight? What's the weight loss really about? What's under it? Is it your fitness? Is it kids? Is it grandkids? Is it retirement? Is it that cruise that you're going on and you wanna be able to do the excursions? What is it? Write that down. And then also write down what you've been waiting for. I love this picture. <laughs> I don't actually know this woman. Um, I wish I did because I just want to shake her hand. <laughs> well, how many things have you put off because you were waiting for the magical weight? Let me ask you a private question. Thankfully, it's a webinar. No one can see your answer. <laughs> Do your bra and panties actually fit? And are they nice? Or have you been waiting? I can't tell you how many women don't buy themselves new clothes. Change of season comes and they stuff themselves in because they refuse to buy new clothes and all it does is feed low self-esteem. Maybe it's a club that you wanted to join or a sport you wanted to try. What have you been waiting for? Write that on your list. How many things have you missed out on? And what if, 
what if you could be like Megan? What if you could shift that focus and really start taking care of yourself? What would that do for you? What would that give you? Okay. Number three, building your confidence. Because that's the next step, right? Once the calm is in place, you've got some space in your head to hear your own voice. You've got the control of understanding, okay, this is what I'm working towards. I'm not going to let anyone steer me away from that. <laughs> now it's time to build in some confidence. And of course, the problem, I've already made mention of this. What are you supposed to believe and who are you supposed to listen to? The conflicting evidence out there is just mind boggling. And I promise that any way that you would like to eat, I'll find you research that supports it. If you'd like to be vegan, I'll find you research that says that's the best way to go. If you would prefer to go paleo, I can find you that research too. You want to do the intermittent fasting? Sure, I can find you research. Will it be good? No, of course it won't. But I can find you evidence. So people speak with this incredible power as though they know what's best for you. But who are you supposed to believe? Every magazine, every naturopath, yep, my profession too, your doctor, TV commercials. It's all BS. They don't know. So it's time to stop being beaten down, get angry, get brave. Exhausting. Yes, you're right, Kim. It is exhausting. I'm trying to keep up with all the latest research. It's enough. How many hours have you spent online? Not you specifically, Kim, but how many hours? sitting there researching, trying to figure it out. The answers are inside. This is a piece of trust. That's what confidence is, is trusting yourself. Be brave enough to trust yourself. Now there's a few steps to this. The first one is start scrapping those rules. Every single time that you've read a new book, started a new program, listened to Aunt Martha, you have adopted a new food rule. And it gets exhausting. They're all floating around your head. It's time to put them down. Now, I'm going to put a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, <laughs> little asterisk, you know, a little read this. I don't walk people through this step until week nine in the 12 week program because there's so many ways that this can go wrong. And I'm sure that there's a little fear bubbling in your stomach right now. I don't want you to suddenly decide that binging and eating donuts the size of your face every five minutes is the right way to go. That's not what I'm suggesting. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that you start to challenge those rules. You start to question the validity of the things that you take to be true. Okay? And here's a few things that you need to do before you actually ditch the rules so that this doesn't turn into a big long binge. Because that's honestly what I did. Sorry, scroll moment here. Um, through my 10 years of trying to figure all of this out. Every book I picked up was like, well, no more food rules. You're going to listen to your own body. You're going to do your own thing. And what happened was I went, yay, no rules. And I was literally like the kid in the candy store. And I ate everything in sight. All it did was reinforce that I could not be trusted with food. So that's my warning. Be very cautious with this step. Okay? This one, I really like to hold people's hands through. But it's so important in developing confidence that I couldn't not put it in here. Not skipping any meals is a key step here. How often do you skip a meal? Or skimp? Maybe it's not even a full skip, but it's just eating a little tiny bit instead of actually eating enough to make you feel full and satisfied. You see so many women that I work with skip breakfast or they have some shake because that's the cool thing now, right? Having a shake for breakfast, which is cool if it works for you. But if you're someone who needs a breakfast, a shake isn't going to cut it. So then you're being underfed. 
And then you get to lunchtime, but someone needs you and there's a meeting and you skip that. And next thing you know, it's three in the afternoon and all you can think about is food. And of course, you're not thinking about some like balanced meal that would be no, no, it's absolutely the carbs and the fat and the sugars, the things that are going to fuel your body quickly, right? Avoiding being hangry is such an important part of this process. Ah, daily skipping. Yes. Skipping leads to so many challenges. So that has to be a really important piece. No skipping. And then the other piece to this is satisfaction. The dieting world has really taken this away from us, right? It's given us all these like pretend things. I recently tried cauliflower mash because I've it's a long story as to why we weren't eating potatoes. But anyways, it does not taste like mashed potatoes. I'm sorry. I, it doesn't. Now, could it have been good? Maybe, but it was not a replacement for mashed potatoes. I'm sorry. There are so many things, right? <laughs> How many things do you eat that you don't even like? Because they're good for you. You know, I had two people tell me last week that they eat eggs even though they don't feel good after they eat them. And when I said, why on earth do you eat them? Then they said that because they're good for me. Well, uh, evidently not. Right? <laughs> Find satisfaction in everything that you eat. It can be nutritious. It can be healthy. You don't have to turn this into a junk food diet, but at least enjoy what you're going to eat. And if you're not enjoying it, Find something else. But really start to think about what do you really want? How many times have you done this? What you really want when you're out for dinner is the pasta. But you know, everyone around you is having a salad and you don't want to be the only one. So you get the salad. And then you go home and you eat your way through the cupboard because you didn't get what you wanted. Satisfaction is so important. So these are the steps to start to build your confidence around food. Now, you may relate to this story. I was on a, uh, a food sanity call with a woman who was interested in working with me. And she misunderstood what it is that I did. And so she thought that I was going to give her this plan. And when I explained to her the process of what I do, she said, what, you think I'm just going to be able to flip a switch? Suddenly trust myself? <sighs> Look at where I've gotten myself. Look at how fat I am. Off she went on her self-punishing rant. I said, of course you're not supposed to just flip a switch. Flipping the switch doesn't work. It took me 10 years to flip my switch. And I got to tell you, I'm still flipping my switch on a fairly regular basis. What's important to know is that there's actually modeled steps and it's called intuitive eating. There are over 75 research papers with intuitive eating now showing all of its health benefits and validity. It's an actual process. It's not just ditching the diet rules. It's not just going rah, 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 which is unfortunately a little bit of what has happened, you know, in this wonderful world of when people ditch dieting and they just swing, the pendulum goes way far the other way. It's about so much more than that. There are actually steps involved. And what's very cool in these studies is that over 75 of them, you know, None of them gained weight. And that's an important thing to know because that's the biggest fear. So again, I ask you, what if? What if you could quiet that voice? What if you could shut that down? And what if you could actually enjoy eating again? Freedom is an option. You don't have to keep playing their game because it is, it's rigged to fail. And you do it with these three steps. You get yourself consciously calm. You get yourself serenely in control, working only in the realm of what you have control over. And then you build your confidence. Does it happen overnight? No. But man, is it worth it. So how? How? Well, I showed you how, but the mission is really, again, about these kids. 
It's making a difference for them so that they can grow up in a world where they're not feeling bad about themselves every time they look in a magazine or watch the movies. You know, it's even in the cartoons and it just, it, it burns me up inside. The messaging is forever there. That the only way to get the guy, get the job, be happy is to lose weight. To look a certain way. The heroine has the fat sidekick. What? It was very cool when I discovered that the research to support 12 weeks is there. It was about that long that it takes of working through. Because, you know, honestly, this is a complete shift in how we think. It took me 10 years, not 12 weeks, by the way. But <laughs> I didn't have anyone to help me. No one was doing this work back then. But it's really cool to watch what 12 weeks can do. Now, if you binge eat like I did, these, these stats will f hopefully floor you the way they did me. After a 12-week program, 65% of them were binge-free. And here's the cooler part. That same 65% were still binge-free a year later. Whoa! That's wild, right? And like I said, with the intuitive eating studies, they didn't gain weight. 75 studies, they weren't gaining weight. So you can, in fact, actually get rid of the dieting without giving up on yourself. I showed you this. This is the process I walk people through. 12 weeks of getting to that place where they can finally find that freedom. It's called Rebel Boot Camp. And what it is, is uh, you get a weekly lesson that you watch online. And then you and I have a call every week. And we talk about what's going on in your world and what you need support with. And we brainstorm. And I teach you how to use the tool. And I teach you how to use it in your life. Because it's one thing to read it in a book. It's something totally different. And that was my challenge was that I could read it. And it was great right up until it hit the fan. And it always hits the fan, right? And then I didn't have anyone to call. I didn't have anyone to talk to. And what we've seen is great success. This is one woman. She... Um, she was freaking out. It was awesome in a good freak out way. She called me so excited. She said, Carrie, you will never guess what I found. I said, what? She said, I found half a chocolate bar. I'm like, yeah. And she says, no, half. It means I ate half of it and I put it away and then I forgot about it. And I thought, wow, yeah, you're right. Like we have a cupboard now that's just, it's always stocked full of stuff. That doesn't call to me. And that's unimaginable because I was the one, man, I was the one. I can tell you stories about how I used to get food and how loud the calling from the cupboard was. Another woman, one of my rebels, this was huge for her. She was baking with her daughter. And um, I wrote this down so I would tell you her story. Right, okay, so she was baking. Her daughter grabbed a bunch of chocolate chips, popped them in her mouth, and then she pops them into her mom's mouth. Now, her first instinct was to be feeling bad about herself. You know, she shouldn't be snacking. Those were unnecessary calories, blah, blah, blah. You can fill in the blank, I'm sure. What was very cool, though, was that she did instead was she got a handle on that voice, you know, that bully voice, the one that was telling her that, you know, she'd blown it because she'd had a fairly healthy day. Were those few chips going to make her fat? No. No. But she knew she let that voice take over. She wouldn't have eaten just a couple chips. She would have eaten all the chips and probably everything that they baked all in one go. And there would have been nothing left. Right? All nothing in out. That's the dieting world. It's not the rebel world. The rebel way of living allows you to create lasting memories. And to do it in a sane and fun way. One more story. That's Lauren. That actually is her picture. <laughs> She's awesome. Here's what she had to say about the process. She said, this past year as a rebel has been life changing. I've discovered a level of acceptance for myself that I never imagined I could. 
I understand my mom put me on my first diet before I could read. My entire life revolved around food, either in a scarcity mentality through dieting or in an all-or-nothing way of throwing caution to the wind and eating whatever I wanted with no regard for my health. My biggest takeaway revolves not around food, at least not only around food, but it's the deep-seated understanding that as long as I'm hating my body, I will never give it the care it deserves. As I have begun to love myself, lumps, bumps, wrinkles and all, I have begun to care for myself again. I exercise because it feels good, not because I'm punishing myself for what I ate. I choose food and make my mouth and my body feel good, and the guilt that dogged me constantly is gone. I find myself simply being happier. I'm not fighting myself, and the energy that saves me is fueled into my ability to enjoy life. I have come to look at my body as my wrapping paper. Whether it is traditionally beautiful or damaged or plain paper, it does not diminish the value of the gift inside. <sighs> yeah. Awesome. Right? <laughs> awesome. She is living her life fully and completely. So like I said at the beginning, I would give you an opportunity to work with me, and I invite you to apply for the Rebel Boot Camp. It's a wonderful program that I feel very strongly about. It's a very powerful program that yields really, really powerful results. I also want you to know that in no way, shape, or form is there any pressure. I say apply because I mean that. I don't let everyone into the program. So if you're curious about it, let's have a call. And I promise if it's not right for you, you won't get sold a thing. But I think a conversation could be super fun. And really what this is about is do you want to do it fast or slow? Do you want to do it over the course of 12 weeks or do you want to do it over 10 years like I did? You know that dieting doesn't work, otherwise you wouldn't be here. The other way, it works. It really does. And I'd love to help you get there. The 12-week program is really about having the tools and knowing how to use them. Because, you know, how many people are tool collectors? Can you relate to that? That was a big piece of my history. I bought every self-help book under the sun. I didn't actually do the work. I didn't know how. Not into my life. I needed someone to help me with the how. The what was fascinating. Got that part. How do I do it for me? That's what I help people with. So if that sounds good to you, I would love to have a chat with you. And you can just type in your number. You can personal message me, email me, and let's set up a time to chat. Like I said, if it's not for you, that's okay. I love chatting with people anyways. I'd like to thank you again for spending time with me tonight. I know that you have a lot of things going on in your world. We do have time. I made sure that I left time for questions and answers. So I would love to take the opportunity right now to hear your comments, to answer questions, to help you fill out your sheet with the... Um, with the goals and the health, if you're not going to focus on your weight, what are you going to focus on? One of the biggest things is the isolation. That's what shame and dieting and all of these things do. And you're not alone. There's so many people here. Okay. Well, if no one has any questions then I must have been exceptionally good at letting you uh, unravel all of that. <laughs> Please know that you can send your questions to, um, to me via email or through personal message. Thank you again for being here tonight. Uh, really, it means the world to me. And um, yeah, you guys have a great night and uh, I will talk to you soon.